my life, or at least kind of like the creative output part of my life, has been pretty dominated by Fleetwood Mac lately. Not that I'm complaining, great band. But through writing a podcast episode that was so long it turned into two episodes, to editing that, posting that, recording it, turning that into two different YouTube videos, it's been hours of my life on Fleetwood Mac, which it's been a ton of fun just learning more about them. Rumors is just such a great album. It's one of the best ever made. I think something that makes it so great is the stories behind the songs. Sure, the songs sound great, but when you know kind of like what was going on around the recording of that album, it's just so much deeper and more layered. And I think that's really interesting to look at. We talked about Rumors a lot in our podcast episode. We even listened to some of the songs, but you know, you can't do that on YouTube. So our Rumors era video is way shorter but it still kind of gets into a little bit of what was going on around the recording of the album. So give that a watch if you want more of the background information. But if you just kind of want to know what each track is about, then this is a breakdown, track-by-track breakdown of Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. So for this breakdown, I'm not going to get into kind of like the extreme background of what was happening. You can watch our videos or listen to the podcast episode if you want to know more about that. I'm just going to kind of look at each track and kind of tell you what's going on with that. So yeah, you might miss a little bit of the context if you're not that familiar with what was going on in Fleetwood Mac and who the members are and all of that. So first up, we have the song Secondhand News, which was written by Lindsey Buckingham, and he sings the lead vocals on it. Like... A lot of the songs that Lindsay wrote for Rumors, this one seems to be about his breakup with Stevie, at least on the surface level, and I don't know that we should dig much deeper than that, especially the opening lines that just kind of like set the stage for what the album is going to be when he sings, I know there's nothing to say, someone has taken my place, like that. I don't know if Stevie was in another relationship at this time, but I mean, it's pretty standard about a breakup. The lyrics kind of read like someone who's just just sick of it though like there's not a lot of heartbreak there's not a lot of yearning in this it's mostly just cut and dry we broke up i'm over it or i'm done i'm ready to be over it kind of attitude to this one what he does sing in it one thing i think you should know i'm not going to miss you when you go which just brutal Lindsay. i mean knowing that your ex is going to hear that that's 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 a that's a deep cut this song seems to be about Lindsay having other relationships after Stevie and just kind of realizing they were better and healthier for him than his relationship with Stevie was. When he first introduced this song to the rest of the band, he didn't sing the lyrics because he knew it would just lead to a big fight with Stevie. I mean, you've heard the song, you know what it is, so of course it would. This song was also kind of the turning point, at least according to the producer of the album, of Lindsay just kind of taking over the creative control of the group. John recorded a bass line for it, and then when he was on vacation, Lindsay decided he didn't really like that bass line, and he recorded over it his own thing. So now let's get on to the, one of the better known songs from the album, Dreams. The song was written and sung by Stevie Nicks, and it was released as the second single in the United States. Eventually, this song did reach number one in the U.S., and it was the only Fleetwood Mac single that actually did that. Stevie kind of told a bit of the story behind how she wrote this album. She said she wrote it in 1976 when she wasn't needed in the studio. And she spent a lot of time in this kind of like side room of the studio. The studio they recorded in was called the Record Plant, super famous studio. And this room was built for Sly Stone of Sly and the Family, Sly and the Family Stone, like you would expect. And it kind of had like a pit in the middle, a lot of like velvet curtains, very good creative space for Stevie. So she would go there and just kind of like write songs and work on stuff. And this song came to her in that room and she wrote it in that room. She said, I found a drum pattern, switched my little cassette player on and wrote dreams in about 10 minutes. Right away, I liked the fact that I was doing something with a dance beat because that made it a little unusual for me. The lyrics tell the story of someone letting go, somewhat reluctantly. It seems to be Stevie saying that she's not gonna stop Lindsay leaving, but she knows that leaving might not be the best for him and he knows she knows he's going to be lonely, but she's not going to stop him anyway, and she kind of hopes that loneliness gives him a little bit more perspective on their relationship. When she first played this song for the rest of the band, they didn't love it. They thought it was kind of boring, but then Lindsay took it, and he added some things to it that just kind of made it a better pop song, you know, because Lindsay was, I think, the best in Fleetwood Mac at doing that at the time, and that must have been so hard for him to do, knowing what the song was about, 
but he did it and he made it one of their best songs of all time so you know props to Lindsay for that i guess all right the third track never going back again the song is another Lindsay buckingham special written sung by him and as you might expect it is about his relationship with stevie or at least that's what people assume it's about given the lyrical content. Lindsay said that this was the last song that was actually written for the album and he never really thought it was all that deep. It's about a rebound relationship and it sounds kind of something maybe even a little bit naive and childish like something a teenager would write about a first love or a second love or you know a rebound relationship. Lindsay never said there was said there was never anything really that deep to it. So I mean, maybe maybe we're wasting our time digging into it. I don't know. Originally, it was just written with Lindsay playing acoustic guitar and then Mick on drums, but he used, like, brush sticks. And I think the original name of this song was Brushes because of that. But in the final edit, Lindsay or the producer, whoever made that call, probably Lindsay, liked just the guitar. So they cut out Mick's drumming. And that's the song that's now on the album. This was never really one of my favorite songs on the album. Uh, I just, whenever I hear it though, I just think of how it must have stung for Stevie to hear this and be like, There's, my ex is just singing about how much better things are with this rebound relationship over me. And that's gotta, that's gotta hurt. So, you know, never one of my favorites, but it's another Lindsey Buckingham special. Don't Stop is the fourth song on the album and it's written and sung by Christine McVie. It also kind of features Lindsay and like a little bit of a duet with Christine. It was the third single from the album and it actually peaked at number three. So, you know, easy to remember right there. Christine at the time was going through a painful separation with her husband, John McVie, who played bass in Fleetwood Mac. And they were married for something like eight years. So this was, this was a hard time. And this song is not what you would expect to come out of something like that. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty optimistic. It's pretty hopeful in what it's saying and in its message. Uh, so, I mean, that's kind of a, a staple of Christine's songs. They're all pretty, pretty hopeful. The lyrics are an acknowledgement that sometimes bad things happen. You know, she says, sometimes you wake up and you don't want to smile. And she's a lot of lyrics about like, things are hard right now, but don't stop. They're going to get better. And it's almost feels like an appeal to the rest of her band in the midst of this very tough time that they were all going through her just saying like, look, don't stop. It's, it's hard right now, but we push through things have to get clear eventually i think that's just very emblematic of christine's mindset she's a very hopeful optimistic person it sounds like based on a lot of the lyrical content this was a song for john but she said she didn't realize that at the time and neither did john it wasn't until someone told him much later that the song was about him and he said oh really but i think sometimes when you're so close to a situation of course it's going to influence what you're writing about and what you're talking about and you know, maybe she was just a little bit too close to really recognize that at the time, but it's pretty clearly a song about her and John's relationship. The song was actually a favorite of Bill Clinton's, who used it for his 1992 presidential campaign. So, a little bit of a fun fact for people out there. The fifth song, Go Your Own Way. The fifth song, Go Your Own Way. Another song written and sung by Lindsey Buckingham, and I bet you'll never guess who it's about. Lindsey said that this was the first song that was written for Rumors, and he actually wrote it in a house that the band was staying in, in Florida, during their tour. Mick hated that house. He said it was haunted and there was just a lot of bad vibes going around in that house, but it produced a pretty great song. So, I mean, Stevie might not like it, but I think the rest of America does. The song is pretty brutal, honestly. Like, you can tell that Lindsay just had a lot of pent up frustration and anger with how his relationship with Stevie went, and this is just kind of his way of venting it. Uh, I mean, the opening lines of the song just kind of set the stage for how harsh it's going to be, where he sings, Loving you was never the right thing to do. And there was even a line in there where he says, shacking up is all you want to do. And Stevie hated that line. She begged him to take it out. He didn't. She said he only did it to hurt her and it worked. And every time she had to sing it on stage or every time it was sung on stage, she would just want to go over there and kill him is what she said. This was the first single release for the album and it was, it was massive. It led to the album being pre-ordered over 800,000 times, which was one of the highest numbers recorded at that time. The sixth song is called Songbird, and it was written and sung by Christine McVie, and she's playing the piano on it as well. Uh, It's a song that kind of takes a break from the heartbreak of the rest of the album, and it's more hopeful. It's just kind of your standard optimistic love song. It really just kind of feels like the start of of a new relationship where everything is happy and rosy, and you can't imagine anything ever going wrong. She sings in it, because I feel that when I'm with you, it's all right. I know it's right. 
But if you kind of look at this song through the lens of what was going on in her life at the time, it's a little bit darker. I mean, this is in the midst of her divorce from John and her dating new people for the first time in however many years. When you kind of look at it through that lens, it almost sounds like she's saying, I know things didn't work out, but I'll still always love you. And you'll still always be important to me, which, you know, it's a little bit sadder, a little bit darker. The actual recording sounds so open and bright, but it's also haunting and it's darker and it's, it's just such a song of contradictions for me and they actually kind of achieved that sound because they recorded it in an empty auditorium with just christine on her piano they set up a dozen microphones throughout the auditorium to catch her to capture different versions or to capture the sound in different places and Lindsay stood backstage strumming on a guitar to keep the sound but that was basically it and it took them all night to get it what how they wanted it to get but i think they kind of nailed that concert style of the song the seventh song is called the chain and this one is actually one of the more interesting in terms of its composition it's the only song that has writing credits from every member and that's because this song was a chain of previous songs that were written by the different members of the band and took like a John bass line, it took Mick drum patterns, it took some Stevie lyrics at the end, it took some Christine lyrics at the beginning and just kind of mixed it all together. Uh, so it's the only song that Mick and John actually have writing credits on in this album. Because of the nature of the song, the meaning can be a little bit scattered, honestly, but I think it fits thematically with the overall message of the album and how the album sounds stevie wrote the end part over a john and mick kind of like bass and rhythm line and i think the lyrics kind of make it clear that again she's writing about this very traumatic and serious breakup with someone she loved she writes listen to the wind blow down comes the night running in the shadows damn your love damn your lies break the silence damn the dark damn the light it's just it's it's hurt it's a song or at least that part of it was a song that's just kind of like come out of anger and hurt some people might view this song as more scattered but i think i view it as the most honest and genuine representation of how they were all feeling at the time they were all going through some very serious life-changing stuff and they were in the studio working together on this album in the midst of that and i think this song just kind of captures that feeling of what what the band was going through and I, you know it's i think it's become one of their most enduring songs i think people generally love it now so yeah that's the chain the eighth song is you make loving fun which was written and sung by christine McVie, and we've talked about this a little bit and i think it was in the second fleetwood mac video it's definitely in the episode if you haven't listened to that go check out our podcast anywhere you get podcasts this song is about her boyfriend after john after her divorce with john and i think some most people assume it's about uh, a guy named curry or carrie it's spelled like curry i think it's pronounced carrie grant who was the lighting director of fleetwood mac and christine actually had an affair with him uh, but it could be about someone else i think who was her boyfriend after that i'm not sure but it's it's about some boyfriend after john mcvee and she told John it was about a dog, so he wouldn't get mad. But <laughs> I think when you listen to it, it's very clearly not about a dog. So I don't think John was paying that close of attention to what was going on, honestly. But John had a very strained relationship with, with Curry or Carrie. Uh, he wasn't allowed in the same room as John, which kind of made things difficult for Christine as they were planning tours and doing the band stuff. So, yeah, it was a, just a tough situation. But again... Christine's song this one's pretty pretty hopeful pretty optimistic pretty loving a little bit different than the breakup songs that stevie and Lindsay were writing at the time the ninth song is i don't want to know written by stevie and it's sung by both stevie and Lindsay. and it's somewhat surprisingly not about her breakup with Lindsay. i think this is the first song that she wrote that's not about that and that's because it was written well before her breakup with Lindsay happened it was actually written back when they were still a musical duo called buckingham nicks before they joined fleetwood mac she had written a different song for Rumors that just didn't really fit with the album, so they switched it out for this one instead. But even if it wasn't about her breakup with Lindsay, the themes on this song definitely do really still fit with that kind of general thing that was going on with the band. It's a more gentle song about the end of a relationship than kind of the other previous breakup songs we've talked about. It sounds like it's just kind of about someone who's trying to find peace in the midst of a breakup, which, depending on where you're coming from, 
could honestly be a little bit more heartbreaking than some of the just anger and bitterness songs. But she sings lyrics in it like, I don't want to stand between you and love, honey, I just want you to feel fine. So it's just kind of sounds like it's a little bit wanting them both to move on. And I'm not sure who this was about. I think it might have been written at a time when her relationship with Lindsay was strained, but not over. So could be about that, but I don't think she's ever really come out and said who it's about. The tenth song is one that's that feels a little bit strange on the album, I'm not gonna lie. It's Oh Daddy. It was written by Christine and sung by Christine. She said it's a song that she wrote for Mick Fleetwood, who is the only father in the group and was someone that they sometimes called Big Daddy because he's like the dude's like six five. He's massive. Uh, and if you look at it through that lens, it almost feels like she's writing about his strained relationship with his wife. Uh, Jenny Boyd and it kind of sounds like she's writing from the perspective of of Jenny and she's saying things like you know I know I'm in the wrong you're always right that kind of stuff because if you're aware of that story Jenny actually had an affair with Bob Weston a former member of Fleetwood Mac so it kind of seems like a very apologetic song in that kind of way an admitting weakness song but both Stevie and one of Lindsay Buckingham's ex-girlfriends said that it was written about John, or it was written about her new boyfriend, kind of directed towards him after John, and it wasn't about Mick at all, so it just kind of depends on who you believe there. It's honestly kind of one of the more darker and pessimistic songs that that Christine wrote, and it sounds, it, the recording kind of nails that, that little bit more pessimistic tone. It feels darker, it feels more ominous. So the producer and the, the musicians did a great job with that one, I think. And this album ends with a Stevie song called Gold Dust Woman. The rumors, I get it, say that this song, or the take that was used on the actual record, was recorded at around 4 a.m. after a whole night of not getting what they wanted. And Stevie actually wrapped a scarf around her entire head, leaving her mouth open, so she could kind of deprive herself of all of her senses and really tap into the emotional state that she was trying to reach with this song. Whether or not you believe that, that's what they say happened. No reason to not believe it, right? And then while she was singing, Mick Fleetwood was breaking glass behind her to accentuate the sound of her voice. And <laughs> apparently he just got too carried away and wasn't really doing it on beat. So the producer was like, fine, just do what you want and we'll we'll make it max we'll make it match what we want it to sound like. So I thought that was funny. Stevie did eventually confirm that gold dust was kind of like a metaphor for cocaine. Uh, Stevie and the rest of the band regularly used cocaine. They thought it was recreational. No one told them that it was dangerous. I think this was before people really understood the dangers associated with it. But still, Stevie said she was looking around and she was seeing friends just kind of get get eaten alive by cocaine and just get super, super swept away in it and losing themselves in it. And eventually that would also kind of happen in a way with stevie as well where she needed to go to treatment to kind of overcome some of these issues with cocaine so i think in a lot of ways she was writing about herself and maybe didn't really realize that but yeah she said this was just a song about someone who's just going through the the struggles of addiction really she said that gold dust woman was a symbolic look at someone in the throes of a bad relationship who's just really going through it and struggling with cocaine and just struggling to find their place and what what they're supposed to be doing in the world so in a lot of ways you can kind of you can draw the parallels yourself there with that song in her life all right well so that's all the songs on rumors i hope you kind of have a better understanding of the stories that were going on in the lives of the band members as they wrote this legendary iconic masterpiece of an album uh if it's no surprise it should be no surprise to you that i love this album it's one of my favorites and i think knowing the stories of their relationships and what went into the writing of it i have a deeper appreciation for what they were able to achieve in this album that's kind of what i'm trying to impart here so i hope you were also able to get that from this uh leave a like if you like the video leave me a comment let me know what your favorite what your favorite track is on this record uh what is my favorite track um i'm gonna look through my notes to see what's i mean i love the hits on this i love dreams i love uh go your own way i love don't stop like I, my favorites aren't super <laughs> mine aren't any of the deep cuts i think my least favorite is probably songbird 
just doesn't really seem to fit with the rest of the album but i loved what they were able to do with the production of it so let me know what you think about this album maybe you hate it maybe you miss the old blues rock of the true fleetwood mac so let me know listen to our podcast if you want to know more information about their story and what was going on around this time 